from there and go up and back deck down. And then if we add this transformation going from this one to this one, we have this. And it's recursive. The reason why it's recursive is because the mappings map onto themselves eventually. If we look at the code, it's, it's really similar to the Sierpinski triangle code. The code itself is not recursive, but the mappings are. And that's what makes this whole thing recursive. Um, so yeah, let's just look at the code a little bit. Uh, class fern. So a draw fern. While true, so that means execute this, just keep doing it over and over and over. Pick from these list of transformations. So the first one says maps to the stem. That means it goes from here to here, to the stem. The second one maps to the left branch, meaning it goes from here to this one. The third one maps to the right branch, it goes down to here. And the fourth one maps from here to here, it just goes up like that. And following that, it says pick from a list of functions and then a list of probabilities. It says 0 0.01, 0 0.07, 0 0.07, 0 0.85. So these are the probabilities at which these mapping functions are going to be chosen. If you choose them all equally, then the chances are very low that this mapping is going to occur more than like five times or something. So we just go up here and get mapped. So it'd be a very sparse fractal. Uh, it would be mo most of the points would be like down here. It just didn't look very good. I tried it. I wish I could like code it and show you. Um, so the 0.01 means that the mapping to the stem happens 1% of the time. The mapping to each of the branches happens 7% of the time. And the mapping up and spiraling happens 85% of the time. So I'm going to take a break now for 10 minutes. Are there any questions? So I guess we'll start up again. <clears throat> Before we leave these iterated function systems, I want to point out how the Sierpinski triangle is pretty much the same thing as the ferns in terms of mappings. With the Sierpinski triangle, we have these three mappings. Um, one of the maps from this triangle to this triangle here. One of the maps from the big triangle to this triangle. And this, the other one maps from this triangle to this triangle. And each one of them are applied with equal probability. Um, so if you think about it, going halfway from any of these points to one of the other points is essentially mapping it down. So say you have this one, this line. You apply the function to all these points. What it does is maps it down to that triangle. So these, you can see these, this, these triangles map onto themselves recursively. And that's why it actually is. There is a recursion going on here but it's not in the code itself. The code itself is just repetitive, but what it's repeating is these recursive mappings onto themselves. Yeah? So there's always more than one way to represent an algorithm. There's always more than one way to represent an algorithm. Uh, yeah, it's really fascinating, especially with these fractals and things. It seems like there's always another way to do it to achieve the same result. And that's one thing, especially Sierpinski's triangle. It's really amazing. So what if in the in your code you don't have like a, a um, in my what? You, in, in, when you like do the code, you don't have like some maybe you don't have a recursive function. So how can you like figure out like without running the code that that would, your output is still gonna be recursive? Ah, so how can you figure out if the output is going to be recursive without running the code? Well, no, you have the code, but it has no recursive function. So right. Yeah, you have a code with no recursive function. If you can't run it, how can you find out that the output is going to be recursive without actually running it? So he said, 
Uh, since the code itself is not recursive, how do you know that the output is going to be recursive? Even if you don't have any recursive functions. Even without any recursive functions. Right. I mean, the thing is, when you write the code, if you realize that what the code is doing is mapping these, these two-dimensional mappings, you can sort of think in your head, OK, these mappings are going to be applied with equal probability. Oops. So just by mentally extrapolating in your head, so you're sort of stepping out of the system. You're saying, OK, what's the thing actually doing? But are you even allowed to do that? I mean, can, you, can you just like, do while you're like, in the system? So while you're in the system? Well, being in the system, in this case, is actually running the code. And like being a computer program running it. Stepping out of the system, but what I mean by that is like taking a higher level view of what's going on. So when you abstract from like all of these like different uh, ways of doing the same thing, you get like this higher thing which actually does show recursion. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes, that's it. So he said when you abstract away from all the details of what's going on with the actual the functions, you you begin to perceive this higher level thing which is itself recursion. Yeah, and, and it has recursion in it. So if you, if you abstract your thought process significantly enough, you'll be able to logically tell that it's going to pre create this recursive shape. Yeah. But it's like no like, uh, simple algorithm or like get any program you have to like see if it's like recursive or not. Yeah, so you mean like a test? Like yeah, like test. test. No, you have to think about it. That's what humans can do. Like, there's no strict test that could be applied to some computer program that would tell you whether or not it's going to create a recursive result. Because in this case, there's no recursive function. So the computer can't know, like, OK, hmm, oh, can I abstract into this? You know, only humans can do that. Yeah, so far. And it's not coded up as a, a system of mappings. It's just these simple functions. I don't know. So yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. So yeah, if you just think about mapping, 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 then you map it over here. All the stuff that was in here that goes infinitely down is now like in uh, in like this little subsection of this little triangle. And you just yeah, it's a recursive structure. So let's go on to the next example, which is very interesting, the Mandelbrot set. Um, first, now that we have this up and running, I just want to run the. The, the programs that are in the handout to, to give you a sense of what's going on. So the recursive transition network, let's run it, see what happens. It's going to generate 100 sentences. Because if you look at the code, uh, there's a print statement that goes 100 times. Uh, yeah, page 5. It says 0 to 100 dot each. Print line, call the function fancy noun. So this is just fancy notation in the groovy programming language to to. Oh crap! It's not working. Oh well, I'll just try to get this to work as I'm talking. I can't do the examples. Uh, yeah, I've been having problems with this this thing all day. So the next example, and the last example, is the Mandelbrot set. Um, you guys probably have heard about the Mandelbrot set. It's very famous, probably one of the most famous fractals of all. Uh, it's called Mandelbrot because this guy, Mandelbrot, uh, really loved fractals and tried to communicate the, the notion of fractals to the world. And this is really a great fractal. So it, it'll get a little bit mathy, but that's OK. Um, so we'll have, it's in the complex plane. So that means that we have this plane where these are the real numbers, and these are the imaginary numbers. I think this is a 